Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the informational session for the Pre-K Expansion Grant, RFA. It is very nice to have you with us this afternoon. We're going to begin with just a quick round of introductions to the folks who are here from the Department of Education who will be helping to support this grant. Um, and then we will walk through the agenda for the informational session. And we'll make sure to provide time at the end for any questions that you might have. You're certainly welcome to put questions into the chat box at any point. We will have people monitoring the chat box. Um, and we'll make a point of trying to address any of those questions orally as well. So, um, for those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet before, I'm Leanne Larson. I'm the Director of Early Learning in the Department of Education. And the Early Learning team is the team um, that where public pre-K programming is based in the Department of Ed. And I'm gonna pass it to Nicole. Thanks, Leanne. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nicole Medor. I'm the Early Childhood Specialist at the Department of Education, and I also work on the Early Learning team. Um, and I know Julie Raymond is here, so I'll pass to Julie. Thanks, Nicole. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Raymond. I am the Pre-K Expansion Consultant on the Early Learning Team at the Department of Education. And I will pass to Marcy. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Marcy Whitcomb. I am the Public Pre-K Consultant here on the Early Learning Team. And that leaves us with Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Belander, and I am the Public Pre-K Partnership Specialist on the Early Learning Team. Thanks, everybody. And one member of our team who is traveling this week and unable to be with us is Stacy McCoy, and she is the Head Start Collaboration Director. And um, I think it's good for you to kind of put faces and names together a little bit here because um, certainly, um, if you apply and are successful with your application for this particular grant, you will work with a lot of us at different times, depending upon the nature of your project. So um, we have a great team to support you. And um, please feel that you can reach out to any of us at any time, even if it has nothing to do with this particular grant. Um, one other thing that... Um, I am going to pop right now into the chat box is a link to where the RFA is posted. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have already pulled that down, but just in case, if it's something you'd like to refer to, um, this will give you the direct link to it. Additionally, as I mentioned before, we are obligated to record today's session and we will make it part of the question and answer summary document that we will post. Um, our goal is to have that posted by October 23rd. Um, we'll cover this a little bit later, but the deadline for questions is October 18th. Um, we know it's a fast turnaround. We are working really hard to be able to make sure that we spend all of the remaining money left in this particular um, source of funding. So we've had to turn this particular grant around pretty quickly. So with that said, um, we always like to make sure that we start all of our sessions that the department offers by making sure folks are aware of both the mission and the vision for our department. So I offer you those slides in a moment to kind of digest them. Certainly the preschool expansion grant connects to a number of the points within the mission and the vision. And then also we like to share the department's strategic goals. So this afternoon, we're going to um, start off by reviewing some of the significant dates related to this particular RFA and then provide an overview of the grant and some of the specifics about it. That will move us into reviewing um, an outline of the various grant requirements that are incorporated in the application. So really we'll walk through the sections of the application and what you'll need to be responding to. We'll also review the scoring criteria um, for the grant 
and then we'll offer time for you to uh, be able to ask any questions that you might have. So let's start with the dates. Um, the RFA was posted last Thursday, October the 10th, and today is the informational session. And as I mentioned earlier, all questions regarding this RFA that um, are asked will be come part of the summary document. Questions must be submitted to the department um, no later than 1159 on October the 18th. We will incorporate all questions that we receive via email by that date, as well as any questions that come up in this informational session. It is very important that if you are submitting questions about this RFA, that you submit them to me, Leanne Larson at maine.gov, because I am the grant coordinator for this particular RFA. And you need to put in the subject line the RFA number so that it will become an official question that's being asked. If Emails don't come with that RFA number noted in the subject line. They won't be part of the summary. So just make sure to do that. We are going to work really hard with our division of purchases to get that summary turned around and posted by October the 23rd. And then all applications for the RFA are due by 1159 on October 31st. So this particular grant is an opportunity for school administrative units to be able to increase the number of eligible four-year-olds attending high quality public pre-K programming in Maine. And this can be accomplished either through starting up a program if you have never had a public pre-K program before, it can um, apply to adding programming to an already existing program, it can also apply to shifting your programming from part day, part week programming to full day, full week programming. So there are a variety of different options that you can think about for expanding your programming. You'll notice in the center of the screen, a couple of the statutes that apply to public pre-K programming. Um, we like to point those out so that you are aware of where public pre-K program is authorized in public law in Maine. It's also important for us to point out that the funding for this particular grant opportunity is coming through the Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan, which is part of the American Rescue Plan. This particular pot of money allows states to obligate the funds through December of this year, but sub for um, this particular um, grant will have allowability to spend those dollars um, well beyond that point. It's just the state that has to have it obligated by the end of this calendar year. These grants will be awards for a one-year period and they are to support new or expanded programming during the 2025-26 school year. So not the current school year, but the following school year. Um, as I mentioned, not only can the grant money be used to start um, up or expand by the number of students that you're serving, but it can also be used to expand from part to full day programming. So you might not be actually changing the number of students you're serving, you may just be expanding the, the dosage or amount of programming that they are um, having access to. Um, all of the programs that are approved through this grant must be in compliance with the standards for public pre-K, which are outlined in Maine Department of Education Rule Chapter 124. And the link to that particular um, set of program standards is included for you in the RFA. We also strongly suggest that anyone who is interested in starting up programming for the first time, take some time to review our um, guide to high quality publicly funded preschool. 
And the link to that is um, found here on this slide. And I bet I can get one of my team to pop that into the chat box for you as well this afternoon. Um, this is a really helpful tool to understanding many of the aspects that are included in chapter 124 and just provides a lot of great guidance for getting a very high quality program off the ground. Few more details. Um, only eligible children may be supported through the preschool expansion grant. And so to be eligible um, for public pre-K, a child must be four years of age on or before October 15th of the school year in which they are enrolling. It's also very important to us in the Department of Education that um, general education public pre-K programs try to be as inclusive of all children as possible, and that includes children who are economically disadvantaged, children who have disabilities, and children who are English learners. We strongly encourage you to think about a mixture of children with demographics that mirrors your K-12 population in your catchment areas. Um, applicants for this particular grant are also strongly encouraged to consider partnering with licensed child care providers or community providers. Um, it is strongly encouraged that school systems think about how they can leverage their mixed delivery system within their catchment area to offer public pre-K programming to their students. So that is another option that you can consider. Um, and also public pre-K programming certainly can be offered within your school buildings or on school grounds, but sometimes we know that school systems in order to offer the programming may have to lease space in another building within their community because they don't have space and maybe they don't have a partner that they could work with. So it is allowable to um, host programming in another facility that you lease. The facility just has to meet the chapter 124 requirement. So as I said earlier, all main school administrative units are eligible to apply. This includes charter schools in our state. And it also includes any of our elementary schools that are operated under education in the unorganized territory or EUT. Um, and as we just talked about, SAUs may apply with the intention of partnering with a licensed community provider. But it's important for the SAU to understand that if you apply with a partner, the SAU will remain the fiscal agent because the grants will be awarded to the SAU. Um, also, with this particular pot of money, it's important for SAUs to recognize that they are considered subrecipients of these grants and any grant that's awarded must meet the requirements of the federal state fiscal recovery fund. Um, and that is outlined for you in the RFA in Appendix B. And that, um, what you find in Appendix B is actually a sample subaward agreement that outlines all of those requirements that will become part of any contract for um, any successful grantee in this process. In terms of award sizes, applicants can ask for a range of funding. If you are proposing to start or add half-day programming to your um, SAU, you may ask for up to $50,000 per classroom. If you are proposing to start full-day, full-week programming, which means that it would be at least a minimum of 25 hours per week for students. You may ask for up to $100,000 per classroom. And if you are a, an SAU that intends to participate in cohort two for SAUs who are trans, transitioning to taking on FAPE responsibilities under IDEA Part B619, 
you may also ask for an additional $20,000. Um, and that will be um, utilized to support any adaptive equipment that might be necessary. All proposed costs must be reasonable and justifiable. We'll talk more about that when we get to the budget section. In terms of what allowable expenses and activities are that can be funded through this grant funding, there is a list on this slide and you'll find this within the RFA as well. But um, what the department strongly encourages you to consider um, spending these grant funds on are really the either one-time costs that will help support getting programs off the ground, including some of the infrastructure costs, um, as opposed to the expenses that are typically more of the ongoing costs. Ideally, this grant money is designed to help you get programming up and running so that then you can use your ongoing um, state and local funding to continue the program and sustain it. So costs that could be involved um, are certainly equipment, materials, and supplies necessary for operating a high quality program. You may need to do some retrofitting of classroom spaces in order to accommodate and meet chapter 124 guidelines. So that's also allowable you can use the funds for establishing or retrofitting playgrounds that are developmentally appropriate for preschool age students. You can use the funds if you need to lease space for the operation of the classrooms. Um, you can also establish outdoor learning spaces. If you're working in partnerships, you can use the funds to help support snacks and meals. Generally, most schools should be, if they're operating the programs on um, within their school buildings, will be able to seek reimbursement for that through their um, school nutrition programs. But if you're working in partnership, um, you can certainly use the grant funds to help support that. You can use funding to support transportation. That can be the Retrofitting of school buses with harnesses, it might be to help provide bus aids on buses um, or the provision of transportation for your children through bus drivers. Um, additionally, um, costs associated with coordination of public pre-K programming can also be incorporated and professional learning expenses as well. The only salary, teacher salary that can be incorporated has to do with ed tech costs. And that is only allowable in this grant if you are proposing a full day, full week program. If you're only proposing part day programming, then you cannot use these grant funds for salary expenses for either ed techs or teachers, but you can use them to support ed techs in full day, full week programs. And then final piece of information before I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole to start walking through the actual application is um, just a reminder that in Maine on an annual basis, SAUs are encouraged to submit the number of new public pre-K slots they intend to add in the following school year, in the fall of the preceding year. So very shortly, the announcement about this year's survey um, for additions to pre-K populations in schools will be coming out. And so if you are planning to add students as a result of this grant application, you are um, asked to please also complete that survey when it comes out. Um, that's very important for generating those estimations in your ED 279. Um, if you have any questions about estimate counts, you can reach out to Donna Tyner in the School Finance Division. She'd be happy to help with that. Um, but it is important to submit that um, so that you've got it in 
um, for next year. If you apply for this grant and you're not successful in receiving it, and that's a determining factor in whether you can actually start programming next year or expand programming, we can work with the school finance division to remove your estimate count if it turns out you won't be able to move it forward. But school finance would very much like you to put that in as part of um, your application. Additionally, when you do seek to start or expand a program, school systems also have to submit a preschool application and have that approved. And those are usually due on April 30th of each year preceding the year when that expansion or startup will, will be beginning. Um, for the purposes of this grant, we allow SAUs to use their approved application for the grant as their application for um, the startup or expansion. So you won't have to do a separate application. Um, later on in the spring if you're successful with your grant application here. Right, I am gonna shift it over to Nicole. Thanks, Leanne. Um, so if you haven't already, Leanne did provide the link uh, at the top of the chat box for folks to access the location where the application is held. Um, if you Click on that and download it. It will open up a Microsoft Word document for you. It's a large document, it's 46 pages long. And the application itself is available starting on page 24. It's embedded on page 24. So everything before that, the first 24 pages, um, is a lot of detailed information in regards to how an applicant should fill out the application um, and some of the uh, components that are required in order for the scoring team to review it and, and score it. So what you'll find in the beginning chunk of that application are these criteria, these application components. And there's four of them. There's A, B, C, and D. Uh, and the first criteria is some general information about your school district. From there, you'll move into criteria B, which is specifications of the work to be performed. So what are the details of your project that you're proposing for your pre-K expansion? Criteria C is where we'll get into or where you'll get into some of your budget narrative and, and you'll find the uh, more information on how to complete the budget forms. And then criteria D are the competitive priorities. So we're going to spend the next few minutes going through these uh, one by one um, and really just hoping to clarify uh, some of the information that's there. And it's important to note that complete applications will include all required information uh, to address each criteria. So what we don't want is folks to hop around or only um, fill out one criteria thoroughly and not the other, et cetera. So um, when your teams start working on the application, just be sure to reiterate the importance of the complete application. Um, and that may mean repeating information from one section to another, and that's okay, um, just as long as each criteria section is completely filled out. So if you have the RFA open on page nine is where you'll find the criteria A general information. So this section is just looking for school districts to complete uh, these documents that are bulleted here as part of their application. And these are really important to complete thoroughly. So you should find the application cover page and general assurances. You'll find also a responsible bidder certification form and a partner listing with letters of intent from each partner, if applicable. So if you're going to open or expand your pre-K with a community partnership, um, then you'll want to make sure that partner is involved in that third listing there and uh, make sure that's complete. All of these documents will be scored with a pass-fail scoring based on completion. Um, so that's why I say it's super important not to hop over these three in the very beginning. Make sure they're filled out and the scoring team will um, acknowledge them as a pass-fail. Um, scoring team is also uh, will also verify eligibility of the applicant. So we'll make sure that the applicant is in fact uh, a public school district or EUT in the state of Maine. 
So criteria A is pretty quick and easy. Um, but then after that, he'll move into criteria B, which is a little bit more in depth. And we ask for really specific information and narrative pieces to each of these. So this is where uh, applicants are going to tell us about the work that you hope to perform if awarded the grant. So you'll find this beginning on page 10, uh, and it'll go through page 12 on the RFA document. Uh, the first section, you'll talk about just a general overview of the project. Oh, thank you, Leanne. <laughs> uh, a general overview of the project. So this is where you'll uh, clearly describe your intended goals, uh, including any indication of which of the following strategies you uh, hope to engage in. So whether or not you're going to start a public pre-K program. Um, if you already have pre-K programming in your school, then you might be considering expansion. Um, and so that might mean uh, adding classrooms. So if you have one or two classrooms now, expanding by three or four, et cetera, um, there's no limit there. And then also an expansion can mean expanding your hours. So if you currently operate part day, part week programming, and you're looking to expand one of those or more of those classrooms into full day, full week programming, then that you know should be well described within the overview of your project. Um, it should also describe the status of public pre-K in your school district currently uh, and summarize any proposal for increasing enrollment and or dosing beginning in the 2025-26 school year. So really any and all information that you're willing to share in the overview of the project is really helpful uh, for the scoring team to, to read through. Another part of criteria B is going to be identifying the need of the community. Uh, so uh, this is common for any school district that's looking to start a new program. We ask you to sort of gauge uh, what is the need in terms of uh, families in your community that might access your program. So for this application, it is required. Um, so you should include a description of the needs that your SAU uh, has in terms of the provision of public pre-K. Um, and this should also be reevaluated on a regular basis. So if you're looking to expand current programming and you haven't uh, collected the needs of the community, then that might be something that you want to do sooner than later to assure that you're actually providing something that's going to be uh, welcomed and utilized by the families that live in your catchment areas. So some things that school districts consider uh, around factors uh, that might also be evident evident, excuse me, is the demonstrated coordination with other early childhood programs and agencies serving children and families in the community to maximize resources. So trying to get a better understanding of what already exists in your area for licensed uh, community-based organizations, whether that's child cares, family child cares, YMCAs, boys and girls clubs, etc. Um, also consider the extended child care needs of working parents. Uh, what do they need for before and after school programming based on the hours that you're considering to offer? Uh, what is the provision of public notice regarding the proposal to the community being served, including the extent to which your public notice has been disseminated broadly to other early childhood programs in the community? So just making the folks in your area aware of your thinking, um, including them on any decisions that are made and just uh, you know, building those relationships and working to make sure that you you have what your families need. Uh, we also encourage folks to show demonstrated coordination with child development services. So I'm sure many of you are aware there are, are Part C and Part B providers for special education services in our state of Maine. Um, and Leanne mentioned earlier that some districts are volunteering to move towards um, taking over a FAPE responsibility. So if that's true for your school district, um, then you may still wanna show that that's your plan and discuss sort of, sort of walk us through what your plan is around adopting those services. If you're not and you're going to keep things status quo with CDS, then um, just demonstrate your coordination with them. Uh, it might be an MOU, it might be conversations and meetings, et cetera. Uh, regardless, the, oh, sorry, I was just going to say one more thing. Thanks, man. <laughs> the SAU should build a case uh, uh, for how the proposed project will address all of the identified needs and lead to better outcomes for children and family. Thanks again. <laughs> 
Okay, another bullet point in criteria B is a project description. So the description will include, although it's not necessarily limited to, the inclusion of these smaller pearls here on the screen. So we'll wanna make sure that you clearly identify the number of additional students that is estimated to be served and the estimated number of new classrooms, if that's the case, and the estimated ratio of children to teachers per classroom. You'll recall that chapter 124 requires a one to eight ratio. Um, also, uh, please describe the length of the school day, the number of days that students will attend per week, and more detailed descriptions of where the program will be housed, um, how the space will adhere to Chapter 124 and or licensing requirements if you're with a partner. Um, describe the evidence-based curriculum and assessment system that should both align with our preschool early learning and development standards um, or plan on how those decisions will be made. Um, a description of your MTSS, your multi-tiered system of support and plans for inclusion. A plan for staffing that meets required credentials and ratios. Uh, your description around professional learning for pre-K instructional staff and administration, as well as coordination and management, your plan for pre-K programming. And then any family engagement strategies that you hope to incorporate, including how families will be informed about students' progress, which is a requirement under 124, as well as transition strategies that you could utilize um, as children begin to enter and exit your pre-K programs. So if you plan to expand public pre-K in your district with a partner, then this part of the application will also need to be completed. Um, you'll wanna make sure that you describe the nature of the collaboration between the SAU and the partner, and then describe um, an outline of what each partner will contribute the successful outcome of the programming. Understanding that those conversations, if this is a new partnership, might still be ongoing. So we'll want you just to do your best uh, in the beginning to outline where you're at now and, and where your goals are in terms of what each partner will be providing. Understanding that over time, an, a more formal MOU will be developed and we would certainly be able to assist with that as needed. But obviously, we'll want to know the name of the organization, any roles and responsibilities of each partner, details about staffing, information about the classroom and the space, etc. Um, and in Appendix D, you'll find more information on um, a public pre-K partnership guidance that, that will help those conversations as well. Recruitment and enrollment. Another important piece of criteria B is including a description of your methods that the SAU and or partners, if applicable, will use to recruit children for the program, including strategies for attracting those hard to reach families. If the program being proposed is universal, meaning it will be able to serve all eligible four-year-olds in your catchment area, then that should also clearly be noted. However, if your program will not be universal and there's a likelihood that you may need to maintain a wait list for students to enter, then a copy of your enrollment policy or your enrollment protocol um, or a description of what will be included in your protocol uh, for public pre-K should be included. Um, so if you have slots for 32 students, but 45 families register, how are you going to make those decisions around which students become formally enrolled and which ones may enter a wait list. So as clear as you can possibly be on that section, if it's applicable, the better. And then your evaluation. So um, at the end of the project, or as we approach the end of this project, we'll want to make sure that um, teams of, of SAUs that are implementing your pre-K programs are evaluating what you proposed and how it's going. So in the application, be thinking about um, how the SAU will evaluate the implementation and more importantly, the effectiveness of the public pre-K program. Uh, it should include methods for collecting information that will be useful to program development and ongoing improvement and sustainability. And the last section, I think, of criteria B is sustainability. Um, so our, a huge goal of our early learning teams is, of course, assisting districts with their pre-K expansions. 
More importantly, we want to make sure that your plans are sustainable. We're really excited that we have the funding to be able to provide for folks to help ease the costs of starting up and expanding programs. But it's all for naught if we can't work together to sustain them over time. Um, so your proposals and your application should include a description of how your SAU and or partners, if necessary, will ensure the sustainability of the pre-K program that you've started or expanded. It should include an explanation of how the SAU will work to secure any necessary funding and continue to meet the program standards outlined in our um, rule chapter 124, which is the basic program standards for public pre-K. Now I'm gonna pass it back to Leanne. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. All right, halfway there. We've covered criteria A and criteria B, and now it's on to criteria C, which is the budget narrative and budget forms. So pages 12 to 13 in the RFA document outline the details um, about, the, about criteria C. Um, a few things before we're going to walk through the budget um, documents that you're going to be completing as part of your application. The budget should include overall projected expenses for the proposed project. It's very important that you demonstrate in your budget narrative how you've come up with the costs that you are proposing. There should be some backup for that. Um, Proposed budgets are for startup and or expansion of public pre-K programming and can only be attributed to costs that were on a previous slide that outlined the allowable costs for this particular grant program. As I mentioned earlier, costs should be reasonable and justifiable. And the scoring team is going to want to be able to see your line of thinking around how what you're proposing is going to lead to high quality programming and your ability to meet program standards. Not only do the budget worksheets need to be completed, but you need to provide a budget narrative that includes descriptions of how projected costs were determined the estimated number of students to be served in the proposed project must be provided, and I'll show you where you can um, incorporate that. And then estimated state and local allocation funding should be included, and I'll show you where that goes as well. So moving on to the next slide, 24. The next three slides are going to be the three budget tables that you will need to complete along with your budget narrative. So on the first um, table, you're going to be filling in the number of classrooms in your proposed project. And you'll fill that in um, to, into the um, row that corresponds with the type of programming that you are going to be offering. So our is your project offering full day, full week, or part day, part week? And then if you are going to be part of um, the cohort two group of SAUs, you can note that right there. You only get um, up to $20,000 per SAU. So um, just, it's not per classroom for this particular part of the budget. So you can just mark with an X to um, indicate that. And you should have talked about that anyway in your application so that we'll, the scores will have a, an idea that you are part of that group. Um, and then you will determine, so if you have a couple of classrooms um, times $100,000 because they're full day, full week, that would be $200,000 and you would incorporate that there. And I'm gonna show you an example of this in just a minute so that'll make a little bit more sense. You'll also provide a very brief little project overview. This is really helpful to the scorers. It just jogs their memory about, oh yeah, in this project, here are the basic things that they are looking to accomplish. It's not lengthy, um, but it gives them enough to work from. The second table is where you're going to map out the overall cost of the programming. So, 
the scoring team is interested in not just what you want to spend the money on, but what does it take to actually provide this programming? What are the costs of for the teachers, for the ed techs, for all instructional materials and supplies that are needed, for any classroom equipment, for retrofitting spaces, and so on? What is the overall cost of the program? Whoops, and then that will, uh, budget sheet will total that up. And then there is a space where you can go back to what you came up with for a total back here on budget table one. Um, and it will fill that information in. In fact, I believe those are all linked. So it should just pull that in. And then it shows you what is remaining. And that's the part that um, would you as a school system would be responsible for out of your state and local allocations. After that, when you move on to budget table three, the total amount for grant funding and what the um, share from state and local funding will pre-populate here from budget table two. And then what you're going to be doing is filling in which of the costs will be being paid for out of grant funding and which would be being paid out of um, state and local funding. And that will total up across each one of the rows, but also down each column. And so I ultimately what you're looking to do is to make sure that the totals from budget table two that came over these columns are adding up to those amounts so that they match the numbers here. So let's take a look at an example because it's always easier to see it, um, what it looks like when it's completed. So in this example, SAU ABC is proposing that it is going to be um, adding two full day, full week classrooms in their school system. They're going to be putting one in Pine Tree Elementary School and one in Mountain Elementary School. Um, and this particular SAU is also going to be part of cohort two, assuming faith responsibilities. And so they are um, seeking $200,000 for their classrooms and the $20,000 for uh, being part of cohort two. So, they are eligible to ask for $220,000 worth of funding. In budget table two, they have outlined all of their proposed costs. So there's costs for the teachers, for the ed techs, instructional supplies, and so on. There's a brief explanation offered here in the budget table but in the budget narrative, these costs would be mapped out and explained in much more detail with backup. The total cost for the project would be $505,000. The $220,000 that's being sought is populated here and the difference would be $285,000 that's remaining that would be coming out of state and local allocations so through your um, ED-279 amounts. Once this part's completed, you move on to budget table three. And what you see that SAU-ABC has done is they have attributed the various costs some to the grant funding and some to the state and local funding. And so what I hope that you'll notice is that many of the costs that might ultimately be a lot of the one-time costs are being attributed to the grant funding up to the $220,000. And then the other costs are attributed under the SAU state and local side. Okay. All right. Last criteria is criteria D, and these are the competitive priorities for this particular grant. 
and there are several of them. So you can earn um, more points if you have a higher percentage of your population that is eligible for free and reduced lunch. You can earn more points if you are establishing a public pre-K program through a partnership with a licensed community provider. If you are offering full day, full week programming, that will earn you more points. If you are accepting FAPE responsibility as part of cohort two, that will also earn additional points. If you are an SAU starting public pre-K for the first time, you've never had public pre-K programming before, that will also earn more points. And if you are an SAU that through this grant will be able to achieve universal provision of public pre-K in your catchment area, that will earn additional points. So there are lots of opportunities in this grant to earn more points than the base um, amount. Conceivably, there could be an SAU that might be able to um, achieve all of these, but um, more than likely there will be you know, a few of them that you might be able to incorporate in your application. And then finally, want to point out, oh, sorry, is this Nicole, is this you? Did I just take over on your, your part? I am not upset. You're all good. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm just going to keep chugging along. Okay. <laughs> oh, all right. At the very end of the RFA, um, document, you will find several appendices which are important to know about. This is where you will find um, the submitted question form, which is hugely helpful to us um, for submitting questions, especially if you have multiple questions. You can just notate the RFA number in an email and we'll include those. But if you have a number of questions, we highly recommend using that form to submit. Um, I mentioned earlier that in Appendix B, that sample sub-award agreement is included there for your reference. That will be incorporated into any contracts with successful um, applicants. There's also guidance about transportation. A lot of um, expansion uh, SAUs that have applied previously for expansion grants have invested some of their resources in transportation um, costs. And so good to review that if that's something that you're thinking about. And then as Nicole had mentioned, the guidance about public pre-K partnerships that's offered can also be very helpful um, as a reference point. Almost to the end, and then we'll take questions. So um, as I mentioned before, the um, questions for this RFA are due no later than October 18th at 11.59. And they will be posted on the same site where the RFA can be found once they have been generated and approved by the division, division of purchases. So we will work as quickly as possible to turn those around um, and get them back out to the field. But it is the obligation of applicants to check back to that site frequently um, to see when those questions and answers have been posted. Additionally, should there be the need for any kind of an amendment to the RFA between now and the time in which the applications are due, you will find those amendments posted on that same site where the RFA is posted. So also the responsibility of any interested party to check back for any amendments. If an amendment is posted, it has to be posted at least seven days before proposals are due. So if for some reason we were to have to post an amendment closer to the act, what's listed currently as the due date, and we, there isn't seven days in between, we'd have to push the due date back to a later date. So make sure to check that site frequently and just make sure there's no amendment. When you do submit your applications, make sure that you follow to the letter the instructions for how to do that. 
not going to read down through every one of these bullet points, but it is super important to follow these instructions because if they are not followed, your application may not be received and then it will not be scored. Certainly make absolutely sure that you have the RFA number in the subject line when you email your submission. Pay attention to file sizes and make sure that they are within the limits. Make sure that um, all of your documents are um, single, um, spaced, typed in a PDF or Word file. Okay, and all of um, these instructions can be found on page 24 of the RFA document. Scoring of all of the applications will be by team consensus. The scores will be based on a 100 point scale and will measure the degree to which, it, to which each application meets the criteria that's outlined on pages 17 to 22. So you're going to want to pay close attention to those pages of the RFA as you're developing your responses within the application. Very helpful to keep those out and just make sure that you're addressing each point in that um, set of criteria. Also, this very last bullet is super important. In order to be a fundable proposal, and to be eligible to receive competitive priority points, an application must earn a minimum of 22 total points in criteria B and nine points in criteria C. If an application does not achieve those point values, then it will not be deemed fundable. And additionally, you won't receive any competitive priority points. So pay close attention to the information being sought for criteria B and criteria C. Those are the places that you've got to make sure that you are providing very clear information so that you can achieve those point minimums. Because what you don't want either is to not have a fundable proposal or a chance at a fundable proposal. And this is just a brief snapshot of the point values associated with each section. You can see that criteria B is broken down into all of its different parts here. And criteria um, C, D, and A um, are also noted. And then finally, we're obligated to make sure that all applicants know that there is an appeal process. So um, if your um, application is not approved for funding, you will be notified of that. And if you decide to appeal, you have to do that in writing within 15 calendar days of being notified. What I will also say before we shift to questions is that um, we anticipate there to be um, somewhere between about a million and a half and two million dollars available in this round of grants. So depending upon how many applications are received, there may or may not be enough funding to fund all of those that are deemed fundable. So that's important to keep in mind as well. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And I think there've been some questions maybe in the chat box as we've been going along. So I'm just gonna scroll back and my colleagues can definitely clue me in if I forget any of them. Um, so Katie, you had asked about um, if the funds are awarded for the 25-26 school year. So, the funds are available only for the 25-26 school year. While subrecipients do have longer than the state does, 
for the obligation and spending of the funds, they only are going to have through um, June 30th of 2026 to spend them. So it covers one school year. Does that help on that one? Okay. And then the next question that you had about if you already have community partners, can you apply to fund more classrooms at the com community partner facility as long as the SAU remains the fiscal agent? And yes, that is allowable. Can, can I ask a quick follow-up question? Sure. Uh, um, for adding more, at, for adding, uh, like we have a half day for adding the afternoon, is that allow, allowable to be awarded the half day amount or the full day amount? So if you want to, Let's make sure I'm understanding your question. If you want to shift a program that's been operating half day to moving it right. to full day, you can ask for the full day amount. Okay. And if it's an entirely new full day classroom, but at a partner facility like the Y, you also could ask for the full day amount. Yes. You full day. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Just to note, Leanne, as long as those programs are full week also. Yeah. Right. And not yes, like a full day, two days. Right. They're all five days. Okay. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Well, they have to meet at least the minimum 25 hour a week threshold. Yeah. Okay. Um, Peter, I think Michelle ex um, explained the your question about the format of the budget documents and the application. If you continue, Peter, to run into any problem with that, just let me know. I think I might have seen an email earlier today, and I just haven't had a chance to respond to that yet, but I will. Joanne, if you were funded in this past round, are you still eligible to apply? So yes, the answer should be yes to that question. Um, as long as you are meeting one of those purposes. Right. So you're either adding more classrooms or more students or you're shifting from part day to part to full day, full week. Were you referring to the um, $50,000 awards from yes. this summer? Yeah. And that was a separate granting program different from the MJRP one. So you're totally eligible. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so Heidi, if we are expanding our universal program from half day to full day, how would we complete table one? So you would, Heidi, you would note how many classrooms you're going to have that are now going to be full day classrooms. And that would be the number um, of classrooms. And then you could ask for up to $100,000 for each of those classrooms. Does that make sense? Um, Ellen, we are intending to be part of cohort two, but haven't been approved yet. Should you include the additional $20,000? Um, I think that you should include that in your, in your narrative somewhere that you are in, that is your intention. Um, we don't want that to preclude you from being able to ask for that money. If it should turn out that um, you weren't able to move forward with that, but you could move forward with expanding public pre-K, that can be handled in contract negotiations down the line. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Heidi, let's say, for example, that we are moving from eight half-day sections to eight full-day sections. The grant will help support that transition. Do we include all the costs for the full day sections on the budget table, even though much of the costs are already in our local budget? Yes, you need to include all of the costs. So you want to see the, the cost, cost and what it costs. We're doing in kind, and then okay, yep. exactly. Thank you. Yep. Um, and then do we get credit on the criteria for being in CDS cohort one? That is not part of that particular criteria. Um, 
So the well, fact that we are already partnering yeah. with CPS, that we already have the pre-Kers in our building isn't going to help us even though we're already doing it. Yeah. It, yeah, that particular competitive priority is just for cohort two. Um, let's see. Katie, one more question. Funds need to be spent by spring 26. So anything we apply for needs to be 100% locally funded for fall 26. Yes, that would be correct. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I have no crystal ball, Katie, to know whether there would be other funding opportunities coming <laughs> forward. I hope that there will be. <laughs> um, but for right now, you should go at this with the idea that you would be needing to. Whatever we offer, we need to make sure we can promise locally right. after. Right. That's okay. And that's part of that sustainability piece, right? You know, we that want you sense. to make sure that you're think, being thoughtful about that. Um, okay. As you're as you're moving forward, and you know, I know we framed it as as state and local allocations, but I mean, there are other ways. You some of you are utilizing some of the IDEA funding to help with supporting programming. Some of you might tap into your Title One funding because that's another allowable source of funding for um, public pre K. But um, yes, be definitely thinking about sustainability. For sure. All right. So, um, Kathleen, great question. Unfortunately, for round four, there won't be the opportunity um, through the MJRP funds anyway for that fourth year of our um, for a second year of funding. You're right that rounds one through three of this particular grant had that option, but unfortunately that's not the case because um, the state has to obligate all this funding by this the end of this December. So we won't have no access to it any longer. Okay. I I'm happy to stay on, and I'm sure that a few of our team can probably stay on for another couple minutes for anyone who might have another question, but also know that um, if you're all set, you are more than welcome to jump off, and thank you so much for joining us today. Katie, are you all set? Katie, did you happen to have any other questions? 